Good morning. This is Dr. Rutledge. I'm going to talk to you today about the uh, mini gastric bypass number two, and particularly in relationship to the treatment of thin diabetics and uh, some recent research from Dr. Kular and Magenda. So let me share my screen. So good morning, and we're going to talk about surgical treatment for all diabetics. Uh, our belief now tentatively is every diabetic who has a moderately severe disease should have surgery earlier rather than late. And I'll see if I can make a case for that. <clears throat> Early surgical treatment for diabetes, uh, hemoglobin A1C greater than 10 or incipient complications. We think urgent uh, surgery is appropriate and medica medications, unfortunately, only change the delta hemoglobin A1C by 1%. And you need a lot more than that if you want to improve the outcome or survival of such diabetics. So um, <clears throat> how do we do that? We recommend MGB2, and we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, earlier in this series, Dr. Kular and Dr. Magenda have shown in their data that the MGB can reverse diabetes in thin diabetics. In uh, 55 patients over six to seven years, their hemoglobin A1C was uh, returned to normal. Yeah, it's an incredible finding and it makes sense when you think about it, but uh, we're gonna talk more about that and what the advantages of our early operation. The mini gastric bypass is just the MGB, but with some differences, no staples. It's less than 30 minutes, so maybe an hour less for operating time, same day surgery, and roughly half or less than half the cost. Hundreds of studies have shown that the Billroth II with no other gastric procedure routinely leads to diabetic improvement and reversal. And the MGB is essentially a Billroth II. And uh, in the past though, we had included a, a collis gastroplasty. And so now we're gonna bring up questions about that addition. Here's some studies. This is uh, we, just examples. There are dozens of these studies, in fact, hundreds. Diabetes remission in low BMI patients with the Billroth II. And uh, in this case, Bill Roth II at two years led to remission in half the patients. Now they're just the Bill Roth II and uh, people get all wound up about other parts to the surgery, but just the Bill Roth II, 50% remission. And the hemoglobin A1C was 6.1%. So uh, a tremendous uh, example, a recent study and there are many older studies that demonstrate that a Bill Roth II by itself is an excellent anti-diabetes medication treatment. Okay, what's an MGB2? Let's talk about it. Well, just remember if you're a, a, a trained surgeon, you know that a Billroth II, uh, I'm sorry, that an MGB is a Billroth II with a collis gastroplasty, and that's the gastric pouch. And the MGB2 is simple. It's a Billroth II with gastric plication. So let's look at some x-rays and pictures and see if we can describe it. Here comes an MGB2. And the reason is we're trying to stop these complications. Why, what, what's wrong with an MGB? Well, any kind of bariatric surgery has reported rates of leak in the two or 3% rate, bleedings up to 20%, stenosis, and these uh, leaks often uh, from perforations and lead to infections and frequently, unfortunately, to death. What's the MGB2 and how is it related to the MGB? Well, here's some simple explanation. The simple philosophy of the MGB is remove the reservoir function of the stomach. And so um, the esophageal extension is a collis gastroplasty. That's the, the idea of the original MGB. Let me move this. Um, we wanted to avoid the EG junction, you no know, dissect in the area of the EG junction, spleen, short gastrics. We want a longer gastric pouch. We want to decrease ischemia in foreign body and the lateral aspect. We want to increase the gastrojejunostomy diameter to improve the increase the chance of dumping. We'd like to decrease or eliminate staple line leak and uh, bleeding complications. And uh, we'd like it easily revised or reversed. And uh, so we're going to say like easily tailored also for low or normal diabetics. 
So gastric plication versus endoscopic plication. Endoscopic plication, gastric plication hasn't really worked very well, but we'd like to point out that the MGB is two is fundamentally different. So we'll look at that quickly. No one or almost no one thinks that plications are a good idea. Actually, the practitioners do them. I don't want to be negative about it, but gastric plication, either endoscopic or laparoscopic, generally has relatively poor or mild weight loss, a high recurrence rate, and uh, laparoscopic plication has other problems, including uh, ischemia and bleeding and perforation. So we don't want that. So here's some examples of plications. These are endoscopic plications. And you can see that they have something that, of course, everyone has, which is a pylorus. And so the reason that the uh, upper part of the body of the stomach that's been plicated has problems over time is because there's a relatively high obstructive outlet here, the pylorus. And there it is, the same thing. And those things over time, we think, lead to dilation of the pouch and breakdown of the pouch and so that's a problem. But on the other hand, the MGB is different. We have a wide open gastrojejunostomy that leads to a depressurizing the stomach. And that's the trick, so to speak, of the MGB too. Uh, we don't have the failures of the uh, other forms of gastric plication. Okay, let's look at an MGB. Here we go. So this is the esophagus. You can see the x-ray dye coming down. There's a gastric pouch. Uh, it looks pretty small. There's the gastric pouch. And there we're reaching down at the body of the stomach. This is the junction between the body and the uh, gastrojejunostomy. And there we see, here we can see the antrum and the plot, the uh, The antrum of the stomach here are partially uh, occluded, and here's the stomach, and then here's the gastrojejunostomy down to the efferent small bowel. There's no filling defect, uh, no filling of the efferent limb, and the esophagus gastric pouch and the efferent small bowel are visible here as well. Again, this is the gastrojejunostomy emptying fast and nothing coming from or going into the uh, afferent limb. And there's some antrum, and you can see now filling, very rapid filling in the, the video. We see this happen in, in seconds, and now it's going into the small intestine. And there it is, filling up the small intestine there, the gastrojejunostomy, and moving along through the uh, various loops of small intestine. And the stomach is empty in almost no time, and that's what we want. We want to interfere with the stomach's ability to keep fatty foods in there and to divert them into the duodenum. We want to avoid that because that leads to obesity and diabetes. Okay, we're going to do an MGB, but again, remember that the MGB is nothing more, the MGB2 is nothing more than the MGB, which is a wildly successful operation around the world. So MGB2 is a Billroth 2 and a gastric plication, and um, MGB is a Billroth 2 and a collis gastroplasty. Here are the steps. We like to talk about this when we're training new surgeons. Here are the steps in performing an MGB2. One, you do a gastrojejunostomy. Two, you plicate the stomach and the antrum, and you're done. <laughs> Again, it, it, <laughs> it's nothing to it. Gastrojejunostomy, plicate the stomach and the antrum, done. So I let people stop me here when I do this presentation if you have questions. Let's do an MGB. We'll look at this. Here's a, a view of it. Here's where the new gastrojejunostomy is going to go. The old MGB used to be up here, so that's different. Find the ligament of trites, bring the loop up. Usually this takes 10 or 15 minutes to get here. Then we close that. And this is the gastrojejunostomy, and it's far distant from the old spot from the MGB. This is the MGB2's location. And this is what you would see here. This is the esophagus ending here. This is the pouch and the stomach. And then this is the junction between the uh, gastric and jejunostomy, gastrojejunostomy right there. And so now we're going to plicate the stomach, and we're almost done. The surgery is almost done. So this is the plicated stomach. 
There's the gastric jejunostomy. You can see up here two rows of anterior gastric plication and the antrum, and we will plicate the antrum. That's the antral plication. It takes only a moment, and you can see no contrast goes in that direction. If you're a believer in leaving some ability to do that, uh, I don't, but uh, it, there's there sometimes might be a reason for it. You could leave a uh, small amount of uh, food to go through and deliver some iron if you believe in that. Okay, let's review the post-op MGB2 anatomy. Again, here it is. So esophagus, the neostomach gastric pouch, the gastrojejunostomy. Okay, now <clears throat> this operation has implications because there is a worldwide crisis. And I'll go through this quickly, but we are in the midst of a tragedy, which is the rising rate of pandemic of diabetes. Diabetes is causing tragic numbers of deaths and diabetes is uh, remarkable because we can now, we believe with the uh, data from Dr. Kular and Dr. Magenda, we believe we can reverse diabetes in many thin diabetics. So this is what we're looking at the diabetes pandemic, the tragic complications, Kular and Magenda's data showing that diabetes is a surgical disease now we believe and diabetes can be, uh, di all diabetics can be a surgical candidate essentially. And we believe MGB2 is the ideal choice for such patients. So let's look at the pandemic. It's a worldwide pandemic with blindness, heart attack, stroke, kidney failure, and amputation. And uh, these are terrible diseases. And so this is an awful thing to face. In the United States, one out of 11 people. And these are again, the diseases the cost in the United States, $137 billion annually. So it's nothing to sneeze at, as they say. And the rate of diabetes is increasing from 5% in 1990 to 10% in 2020 is the prediction. Uh, costs, uh, 320 to $670 million predicted in 2060. We believe this is essentially a red alert alarm that we need to do something. And so we sit here quietly while this happens and many people are harmed by this. And we, we think we can't afford to wait any longer. Let's look at Kular and Machenda's data, which confirmed that we have a solution. The MGB and now is a better, simpler, faster and cheaper treatment, the MGB2. Here's an example of a patient who had an MGB. She presented uh, with a, a BMI of 25. Uh, her HbA1c was 15. She had a, a, a mini gastric bypass in, uh, 19, in, in 1918. I'm sorry, 2018, excuse me. And uh, follow-up in 2024, uh, six years post-op, her hemoglobin A1c was 4.7. That's normal. Now, Maybe she wasn't cured. Maybe she'll get it back and you'll blame that. But to me, her triglycerides were normal. No recurrence of her diabetes. She was on insulin. She's not on insulin anymore. Improved quality of life. Resolution of sleep apnea. That's from a short limb MGB. And an MGB2, we believe, will do the same. This is the data. And basically on 52 patients followed for seven years, the mean hemoglobin A1C preoperatively before the surgery was 12.6 and postoperatively at seven years was 6.1. That's not diabetic. So you can say it's reversed or whatever. If I would pot potentially like to tell the patient they're cured, it might come back if you eat poorly. But if I'm not allowed to say cured, I'd say it's re reversed for seven years. That's I think it's earth shaking. Again, this is the same data. Imagine 12.6 to 6.1 for seven years in 55 patients. Here's the study. Look at this. So 12.6 is arrival. The first year is seven. Second year, 6.7, 6.4, 6.2, 6.1. Every year better. The MGB makes diabetes better. Here's an example of the C-peptide levels. And what we see is if you wait, C-peptide will tell you that as it declines, the damage in the pancreas is leaving you with less opportunity to have the beta cells create insulin. 
So once you get to the left end of this screen, this, these patients are less likely to be cured. They're eight and seven and down here, and this is early in the lifespan of a diabetic. What we believe is early operation for diabetes. This is a very radical statement. Early operation for diabetes, early operation for diabetes, and it looks as though maybe we can reverse it. In fact, I don't know, maybe cure. Now, uh, people say, oh, you can't operate on thin diabetics. You can't operate on thin diabetics. Here's the albumin level. And two people had a slightly low albumin for other reasons. So none of them essentially had an abnormal uh, albumin except for two out of the 55 patients. Here is vit vitamin B12. And vitamin B12 was actually lower before the surgery. So their, their uh, surgery gave them a better a better and improved B12 level throughout uh, the age uh, distribution of the pa patients we operated on. Almost everyone has a normal hemoglobin A1C, I'm sorry, has a normal BMI. If normal BMI is between 18.5 and 24.9, well then 100% uh, have a normal body weight. It's pretty close. Now, we worked with the artificial intelligence and we created a model based on the um, hemoglobin A1C level. And basically what we were able to demonstrate is that for the 37 patients we had data on at, at, for, to do this study, at 10 years, the projected cost for medicine was wildly different if you had the hemoglobin A1C from before the operation to the hemoglobin A1C after the operation from $2.8 billion to $900,000, with an estimated savings of $1.8 billion if this is a correct extension of what the cost might be for those patients. So again, this is another way to look at it, that for the 55 patients with hemoglobin A1C greater than 10, everyone was greater than 10, the estimated 10-year medical costs for the patients was $4 million. The estimated 10-year medical costs for similar patients who had a hemoglobin A1C like those in the group, less than seven, they were predicted to only cost $1.5 million. That's a savings of almost $3 million. So if you're a hospital, if you are a patient and you want to look not only at the ability to save lives and blindness and other things, the cost savings are gigantic. Now, another study we did is we looked at the risk of, of coronary vascular disease, cardiovascular disease, and this is include heart attack and stroke. And basically, if you had the hemoglobin A1C of these patients preoperatively, then their risk of having a heart attack or a stroke is above 100% for every single one of them at their numbers. And after surgery, with their numbers in the below six range, it was zero. In other words, 100% you will have a heart attack or you won't. And the MGB made the difference. An MGB surgery, maybe 30 minute MGB2, and you would go from 100% you will have a heart attack predicted by the model to you will not. <clears throat> so our conclusions tentatively is the following, that knowledge and experience with MGB shows selection criteria tells us we should operate early and liberally. The cost for an MGB2 is less than a year's worth of medications, depending on the medicines. We can treat now all ages, in our opinion, and uh, Coulard's data suggests that the pre-mean pre hemoglobin A1C of 12 that has a five-year success of almost 95%, getting them less than seven. So it's a rare patient who doesn't get less than seven. We now know the MGB, MGB2 can reverse severe diabetics for at least five years and up to seven. Now, a reminder again, what's the Bill Roth 2? Well, Bill Roth 2 has been shown to decrease diabetes. And here's a Taiwan, it decreased the risk 
of diabetes from six from 13% of the population to 6.7 of those who'd had a bill roll two. This is that Taiwan nation database, just, just the bill raw two, just the bill raw two um, led to a 50% decline in diabetes with just the bill raw two. Worldwide, India is a diabetic pandemic. And we believe that the uh, MGB2 can act as a treatment. Now let's go back and talk about the MGB2. We think now, this is our tentative opinion, but essentially, if you can be cleared for surgery, you should have surgery. Every diabetic should consider having surgery because the outlook for surgery for diabetes over the long term is poor and sometimes disastrous and terrible and expensive. And a short term Bill Roth 2 MGB2 is simple, easy, and effective. Remember, Bill Roth did this back in 1885, so that's 139 years ago. And what we know is that uh, patients of ours, here's a patient of Dr. Kular's 10 years after his surgery, his hemoglobin A1C has decreased. Here's another demonstration that the 10-year hemoglobin A1C decreased amputation risk as calculated by some public data. Um, there's over 100 articles where Bill Roth 2 improves or re reverses diabetes. There's animal studies. Here's some more studies, basically uh, Bill Roth 2. And uh, the reason for it is because we divert the food from the gastric, from the normal route through the duodenum and uh, another article and another article. These are various drugs. They cost a lot of money <laughs> and sometimes they're not going to be helpful. So we can do better. Surgery once more. Vacation of the stomach. There it is, antrum, efferent, afferent limb. Vacation of the antrum. Vacated stomach is narrow. Thank you all very much.